Binswanger, the HB and HB TV. I'm a philosopher who advocates Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. We're doing a series of uh, episodes on free will. Last time we discussed if free will is true, why are so many uh, children of Catholics Catholic? And the other way around, so many Catholics are children of Catholics. And uh, children of Democrats tend to be Democrats. And generally, there are national types. You know, the French tend to be flamboyant and the English repressed. All those stereotypes are based on something. Most of them. I shouldn't say all of them. Many stereotypes are, are stereotypes because they reflect a, a, a statistical average uh, among people. So why is there that? And I said the reason is that the basic choice is the choice to think for yourself or not. If you don't think for yourself, the overwhelmingly most popular alternative is to follow the crowd. If you don't think about religion in a first-handed way on your own, the thing you're most likely to do is go along with the religion you were brought up in. So that raises a more general question, which is our topic today. What are the effects of others on the individual and on the culture? What are the dynamics of interpersonal relations in regard to how other people and institutions affect your actions and the course of history? The theme of this episode is that free will is delimited. It's not omnipotence. And there are, uh, in addition to free will, certain principles through which free will operates that renders the course of history and the behavior of individuals intelligible. Free will does not mean an Epicurean swerve. You know, the Greek atomist Epicurus thought he had to introduce particles swerving to collide with others just randomly in order to explain the phenomena that we, we see. If everything just moved in a straight line, there would be no interactions and no world. So he said every now and then, a little atom, he was an atomist, collides into another one arbitrarily. Well, free will isn't like that. Free will is not, as I said in the first episode, it's not indeterminism. It's self-determination, self-direction. It is not chance. It is choice. But choice is very delimited. It's a choice to focus your mind, set a purpose, be intellectually alive and active, or to drift, coast along, effortlessly, passively reacting, be a passenger in your own mind, or even worse, to evade, to pretend that certain things don't exist that you know do exist. Now, from a psychological standpoint, the issue of free will is the issue of who's the boss, your conscious mind or your subconscious. Now, your subconscious is not some Freudian monster of seething emotions in a cauldron inside you. The subconscious is just your hard drive, just your memories just the stored information you've accumulated from what you've observed. But a rational, in-focus mind, 
observes different things and notes different things and makes different connections that then get stored in his subconscious, which is really just the brain's ability to supply and store, to store and retrieve information. It's like a database program. So you're, what comes out is very different if you go with the flow in our a passenger, what gets stored in your brain or your subconscious is random associations. When I learned the Pythagorean theorem, it was raining. So you say to me, Pythagorean theorem, I think rain. I mean, that's pretty bizarre because you don't remember when you learned it, but in principle, that's a random association. As opposed to a logical connection, Ah, the Pythagorean theorem is about triangles. It's about right angle triangles. That's studied by the science called geometry. The Pythagorean theorem is proved. I may not remember all the steps, but it was proved long ago. And the proof was a process of logical step-by-step -step reasoning. So when you hear, when that kind of stored connection is in a person's brain, he hears Pythagorean theorem and he thinks geometry, logical deduction, reason, ancient Greeks, triangles, right triangles. Maybe he remembers hypotenuse right off the side. Uh, <laughs> squares on the side. Maybe he remembers that right away, maybe not. So you see the difference between a passive mind that maybe notices certain things happening at the same time as other things and a logical mind that directs what it connects to what. So the subconscious of a person who uses his free will to identify reality, to make logical connections, Develop, he, the free will that he uses develops an orderly, logical set of mental files. And when he thinks about a topic now, relevant, logically connected information comes to his mind. We started this with Sam Harris, who says, you don't control what comes to mind. Well, in a very short-term way, you don't. Banana, all right, you might have thought yellow, you might have thought peel, you might have thought slip, you slip on a banana peel, you might have thought fruit, but whatever you thought when I said banana, whatever popped into your mind, that was not an issue of free will choice. But you also have control indirectly over how you access stuff in your subconscious, like you could say, what is the most fundamental fact I know about bananas? It's not that they're yellow. It's not that you can slip on the peels. It's that they're a fruit, tropical fruit. So you can identify the fundamental, the essential of what you're dealing with, or you can just free associate. Banana, peel, slip, fall, Charlie Chaplin, silent movies, movie night, friends. I mean the show friends. I'm just doing some random association. Uh, Chandler, aging, he aged over the, you know, you can go on like that forever. But those, those are not logical connections and a different kind of person results from thinking and storing the products of your thinking versus being a passenger and free associating, storing random connect, random associations, not logical connections. <clears throat> your character, your moral character is your nature, your identity insofar as it's shaped by what you've automatized 
in terms of moral values. That's paraphrasing Leonard Peikoff in Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, the single most definitive, by far, a treatment of the objectivist philosophy. He says, character is who you are insofar as it's shaped by what you've automatized with regard to moral issues. Well, what you've automatized depends upon were you in focus, were you thinking, were you rational, were you seeking to know, or were you drifting along, or were you evading? No, that can't be true. I won't let it be true. So the issue of free will is who's the boss? Your conscious mind, which you have to turn on and drive, or your subconscious random associations that you are not in control of, that just happened. So you have a nature. You have automatized over the course of your life a certain approach to reality. Not completely. You retain the ability at the margin, as I put it, to change, to turn the battleship, you know, very slowly by making little choices that start changing the moving average of what you do. So if you start being independent and thinking about things, gradually over years, you become an independent person. You're getting more independent all the time, of course. It's not like just suddenly you become an independent person, but you have a nature. Your subconscious has stored what it has. It will feed you what it's stored. You have the power to judge it and subject it to logical scrutiny. And that's your free will. Do you do that or not? I mean, that's part of your free will. You also go out and seek information. So, if you have a nature, if you have a subconscious with stored content, the solution to problems of a, of a large kind is not, well, be good. Use your free will right, not wrong. It is if you have the objectivist theory of free will, really. If, if be good means in the next moments, and from then on, focus your mind, that won't solve all your problems, but it'll start you on the road to recovery. Or the other direction. If you are a good person, if you unfocus your mind and begin to drift, you will gradually change the average of how you function and become a bad person. But the idea that um, you can just turn around on a dime is just the wrong theory of free will. And it showed up in an article by Joe Lieberman in the Wall Street Journal, which I have right here. Joe Lieberman is the last living liberal. He should be in a museum because when people say liberals, conservatives sometimes talk about liberals. There are no liberals aside from Joe Lieberman. Maybe Joe Manchin now. Maybe we got two. Leftists are not liberals. Progressives, i.e. regressives really, are not liberals. They are not like the old style Hubert Humphrey, Jack Kennedy, and Joe Lieberman type. They're a, Elizabeth Warren has no relation to Joe Lieberman or Joe Manchin. So Joe Lieberman wrote this column in the Wall Street Journal on December 24th. And uh, I want to read you the, the wrong idea he has in here. He's talking about how Joe Manchin did a good thing in vetoing the Build Back Better bill. I said it. Because it was not put forward 
Lieberman thinks. Uh, the, the whole approach was not right. It was not bipartisan. He wants to bring back what is called in the Senate regular order. He says, quote, regular order is a sensible process that is open to public view and invites bipartisan collaboration in the national interest. That's the way liberals, who are pretty repulsive, talk. The national interest, bipartisan collaboration in the national interest. Now, I'm not going to rant on the anti-concept of bipartisan. Bipartisan is an invalid, destructive concept. National interest is too. But he's in favor of something that he calls regular order, which you, you know, think of as civility, uh, proceeding in a in accordance with the way government should function in the Senate. And here's what he says. To work, regular order, to work requires an attitude toward public service that we haven't seen much of in Washington in recent years from either party. It begins with a personal decision, free will, by elected leaders that their primary purpose is to get things done for their country and constituents, and that getting things done matters more to them than pleasing their party, their campaign contributors, or the increasingly partisan media. Close quote. Yeah, you tell them, Joe, shape up. Shape up, you congressman. That's what's wrong. What's wrong is that there's not enough morality in the Senate. People have to turn, use their free will to say, I'm not going to worry about getting reelected. I'm not going to worry about pleasing the party bosses. I'm not going to worry about what the New York Times says about me. I'm going to do what's right. That is not possible. That is, is ridiculous to say, hey, you senators, start being moral. Use your free will. Start being moral and put the interests of your constituents above your own reelection interests. And they're supposed to, oh, oh, gosh, he, he really called me. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And then they do. Now, it's not because people are immoral. It's not because they're evil. To some extent, these guys are. But that's, it's wrong philosophically to think that the course of Senate activities and what laws get passed and what laws fail has to do with the personal morality of the senators. The personal morality of the senators or the president is pretty much important. Uh, useless and irrelevant. I know that people like to vote for the, the presidential candidate that they think has good character, but that doesn't mean much. It's better to have a president with bad character in a good cultural atmosphere than a president with great character in a terrible cultural atmosphere. You could take George Washington and drop him into Hitler's Germany and put him in the Reichstag before it was uh, abolished, or make him a uh, gal lighter of something. He couldn't do anything. And by the same token, you could take Hitler and put him in the cabinet. I, I mean, it's not really believable to make him president, but okay. Make him president. Hitler's president. He's going to be out of there in a week. He cannot change the direction of the battleship on a dime. People do this all the time. The whole culture wars. If you watch Fox News and then you watch MSNBC, and I do bounce back among the different network. Both sides say the problem is the other side is evil and stupid. Both sides say that. That's not the problem. There's no more evil 
in terms of the choice to think or not to think now than in 1776. Shocking. What there is is the same phenomena that there, the phenomenon that I talked about in regard to children of Catholics being, having been raised by Catholics. The people who don't think are following the people who do. And when the people who do think have produced better ideas and they have become part of the um, cultural subconscious, in effect, part of the stored wisdom, the assumptions taken for granted by people, when those are good, even the conformists are conforming to that. So in 1776, both the thinkers and the non-thinkers were a lot better than anybody in Nazi Germany, who anybody in public life in Nazi Germany. They were, that's another part of the equation. People who disagree with the ruling ideas, the ideas that everyone takes for granted, generally, not always, but generally, the average person who disagrees, are sidelined. So if, um, if Ayn Rand had, had, well, Ayn Rand in Russia, I mean, it's a pretty dramatic case, right? Ayn Rand grew up in Soviet Russia under communism, and she had, knew she had to get out. She didn't think, oh, well, I can rise in this society and spread my ideas here. No, it's impossible. You'd be sent to the gulag. And by the same token, if you took uh, 1776 America and tried to put in Lenin to spread his ideas in 17, he'd end up kicked out or laughed at or marginalized in one way or another. So the issue of free will is just one of the things that determines the course of history, and it does it very slowly, very long range, not by so many individuals choosing to think. My, my hunch is, I won't even call it a hypothesis, my hunch is the percentage of people who are fully rational is about the same in any large population. You know, it's maybe a half of a percent. And almost fully rational, it's probably 2% in any population. Semi-rational, semi-irrational is probably 90%. And then, you know, there are a few who are really violently irrational. That's just my guess. I don't see any reason why um, there would tend to be, you know, among millions of people, a shift in the percentage. You know, like suddenly 10 or 20% of the people are fully rational Ayn Rand heroes. And in another uh, situation, for some unknown reason, nobody or just one guy out of 10 million does it. So I, I assume that it's fairly constant. What differs is the other factor that controls history. Premises, ideas, the Ideas that a person holds, an individual holds, determines what he does. The ideas that are dominant in the culture determines the course of the actions of that culture. Now, ideas exist in a hierarchy, like ideas about what's healthy, you know, sugar healthy. A lot of people say, no, I'm not convinced that they're, that they're right. Sugar is healthy, sugar is unhealthy, depends upon ideas about metabolism. 
atherosclerosis, anatomy. And those ideas, those sciences depend upon epistemology. What, what do I mean by that? Well, whether you have a science of anatomy and a science of heart disease and a science of medicine and a science of anything depends upon whether you believe that reason or faith is the way to knowledge. Whether you believe that abstract ideas can be based upon and tested against reality or you think only what you see, smell, touch, and taste is real and the rest is hot air. And in the case of anatomy, you have, for instance, uh, it was a crime to uh, dissect corpses, corpses uh, until fairly recently because of the influence of religion. Well, what's religion? It's an idea. It's a primitive form of philosophy. It's a metaphysics a theory of knowledge, namely that there's only knowledge through God, and an ethics, serve God, and a politics, render under Caesar, if it's Christianity, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. <clears throat> render unto God what is God. So you can't combine a science of anatomy with a view that faith is in the Holy Scripture is the only means of knowledge. So you can't decide is sugar healthy or not in a rational, logical way without science, which depends upon epistemology, reason. And some of the experiments depend upon a metaphysics and an ethics and a politics that will tell you, yes, you can do this. It's possible. It's moral. It won't get you burned at the stake. So um, that shows how some ideas depend upon other ideas and the deepest and widest ideas are the ones that condition everything else. And those are the ideas of philosophy. By definition, it's not like we start with something called philosophy and then say, hey, what do you know? It deals in fundamental, wide, deep ideas. No. You identify in many different areas and ways the starting point, basic, widest ideas, and you say, well, you know, if we put those together, organize them, study them logically, that's a discipline. Let's call it philosophy. So philosophy, the, i.e. the widest, deepest, most fundamental ideas are behind all the specific ideas that people live by. And the free will that has the most effect on history is the free will of the great philosophers. Even within philosophy, there are those that philosophers who, who make fundamental uh, conclusions, draw fundamental conclusions and set the tone for centuries, like Immanuel Kant has done, unfortunately. And then philosophy, philosophers who just work within the square provided by them, like Maurice Mandelbaum. Now, that's an actual contemporary philosopher, but you've never heard of him because he's just a minor linguistic analyst of the 20th century working within the square created by people like Russell and Quine and Ryle and Austin who were working within the square created by their predecessors, oddly enough, Hegel. In part, they were reacting against Hegel. In part, they were really accepting him. And Hegel is just a wrinkle on Kant. <laughs> so the, the great philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, and Kant, and then Ayn Rand, in my view, and I'm right, by the way. They are the ones who, who set the premises within which philosophers work. And those 
philosophers set the premises within which the economists and the English literature professors and the historians and the mathematicians and physicists work. And they set the premises within which the more direct opinion leaders work, such as the newspaper editorial writers, uh, newspaper reporters, uh, the media personality, and so forth, so that the accepted wisdom uh, that no one questions, almost no one questions, is created by philosophers. And the most fertile of the philosophers, the most towering, the smartest, the widest ranging, the most integrative of the philosophers are the ones who we really need to be rational because their ideas set the tone for everything else. Now, I don't want to suggest that the followers, you know, the other intellectuals are not uh, using their free will. But if their free will can't answer the arguments and demolish the system of the, their predecessors, then they either have to work within that system or go into some other field. So there are lots of people who know that Kant is wrong. Or let me put it this way, who sense that Kant is wrong, feel that Kant is wrong, and could say a few words why, but they're not going to get jobs in philosophy. They're not going to get jobs probably in any intellectual field because they're going against the established wisdom, which is actually established error. So the objectivist theory of free will is a choice to think or not to think, plus the ideas of the conscious mind and its interaction with the subconscious lead to the conclusion that the biggest uh, component of the course of history is the free will choices of the, of the philosophers at the top of the pyramid. The most influential philosophers are the most influential people in the universe, or at least on this planet. So I'm at the 4.33 mark, and Dylan, did we have questions uh, on this today's uh, subject? We do have a question from Jeff. He asks, okay, let's, let's do it. In college, I accepted the theorem as some proven truth known to the best of our ability to know. A theory was something still in question. Am I wrong? Could you read that again? In college, I accepted the theorem as some proven truth known to the best of our ability to know. A theory was something still in question. Am I wrong? Oh, he wants to know about theorem and theory. Yeah, you're partly wrong. Um, the issue of theory or theorem, uh, yes, theorem, is not an issue of certainty, which means it's not an issue of how well grounded or proven it is. It's simply how abstract it is. So when people say evolution is a theory, yeah, so is the law of gravity, and so is uh, A plus B is the same quantity as B plus A. Those are abstract statements. It doesn't mean they're tentative. The opposition is not theory versus fact. It's theory versus practice. Generalization versus specific. If you want hypothesis versus certainty, that's on the scale of how much evidence is there for it. Also, I would say you, uh, you can't accept a principle, let's call it that neutrally, a principle as true merely on the basis of it's taught to you as true. You have to either see the reasons why it's true, 
or else say, I assume this is true because I was taught it and it appears that a lot of practical, successful action depends upon it. But you can't say, well, I was taught it, so it's true. Okay, that would be the, the one um, question. I didn't explain why I called this uh, episode Reason in History. Reason in History is the title of a book by Hegel, so it's kind of a pun. But it's an accurate one because reason, the, the extent to which a culture is based upon reason and rational philosophy is the extent that it moves in the right direction. It's not the morality of its representatives in some parliament. It's not the personal morality of the man on the street. It's whether enough choice has been made by people who identified fundamental principles that are true, or whether the choices were uh, bad of those people. So for instance, just to concretize it, I think when you read Aristotle, and give three, three examples, when you just pick up and read Aristotle, I mean, it's not easy. It's very, he's translated in a very dry and technical way, but you can get an idea. You get the very strong impression of here's a guy who was totally honest, who wanted to know the truth, who wouldn't just maintain his view, blanking out contrary arguments. He wanted to know what was really true, even if it meant he had to change his mind. When you read Kant, you get the impression, here's a guy who's trying to put one over on you. Here's a guy who is contradicting himself all over the place and trying to hide what he's saying. He's not trying to get you to understand. He's trying to impress you, bamboozle you. He's a con man. Plato is somewhere in between. There's some authentic curiosity there, and he got a few things right. But there's also a very vicious inferiority complex that makes him want to rule over others, and he is known as the father of totalitarianism. So there's a lot in Plato that's ugly, but there are some good things. So we have the good, the bad, and the ugly here. And with that, I will say thank you until next week when we, uh, I will take up, I think next week, parenting very briefly. And then the uh, argument that determinism, the opposite of free will, is self-refuting. Thank you, and I'll see you next Monday.